Good afternoon and good morning, everyone, and thank you for bearing with us as we resolve some technical glitches and apologies for starting late. But thank you for joining this webinar, Are You an Innovator in Stepping Up? My name is Mark Sobel and I am the Senior Policy Analyst here at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and I will be moderating today's webinar. To give you an overview of the webinar today, we'll start with some introductions, then discuss the Stepping Up initiative and the criteria required for counties to become innovator counties within the initiative. Then we'll hear about some of the stepping up work happening around California, and then we'll hear specifically from Calaveras County and San Luis Obispo counties about how they collect baseline data on serious mental illness in their jail systems and their efforts to reduce this number in their jails. And at the end of the webinar, we'll have time for questions and answers, and after the webinar is over, we'll be following up with participants with a link to a survey to fill out that will give us a better sense of whether your county could be an innovator county within stepping up. We're excited to have four panelists joining us on the webinar today. Risa Hanneberg, Deputy Division Director at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Hallie fader Tao, Program Director at the Justice Center. Samuel Leach, Chief Probation Officer in Calaveras County Probation Department. And Jessica Yates, Business Analyst, San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office. Thank you all for joining us today. And before I move on, a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, during the webinar, you can ask a question at any time by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We'll respond to the technical questions as we go, and we'll keep a running list of content-related questions and hold them until the Q&A section at the end. And for some brief information on the Justice Center, which I think many of you are already familiar with, um, but for some context, uh, we are a national nonprofit nonpartisan organization that develops research-driven and consensus-based strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. Now I will turn things over to Risa Hanneberg, who will talk about the Stepping Up initiative and what it takes to be an innovator county under Stepping Up. Hi, everyone. This is Risa Hanneberg. I just want to do a sound check. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so again, good good morning and good afternoon. I am very pleased to uh, have this opportunity to uh, speak directly with our stepping up counties in California. And just going to do a couple slides, um, probably hopefully reminder slides for you about the stepping up initiative. Um, but it is um, almost we're going to be celebrating our fifth anniversary this coming May. And so we're super excited, not only about um, all the work that we've done over the past five years, but also I think uh, moving forward we're going to be announcing uh, some exciting um, um, opportunities and how we plan to advance the work in the next couple of years. Um, Stepping Up is a national initiative to reduce the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. And the Justice Center, along with our partner organizations, NACO, the National Association of Counties, and the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, have been the leading partners in this work. Next slide. And this is just kind of everything in a nutshell, if you will, but um, we're so excited to, um, you know, again, celebrate the work that's already been accomplished with Stepping Up over the past five years. Uh, we have uh, Stepping up sites now in 43 states. Uh, we figure that it covers about 47% of the United States population. As you all maybe already know, about 2 million uh, times a year people with serious mental illnesses are admitted into jails across our country. And we've been working uh, not only in these individual sites across the country, but as you know, we have some very targeted work in states across the country, of which California is one. And just a few updates here. Uh, we are now, we are actually at 18 Innovator Counties. We will be announcing a new one in the next week or so. And we certainly hope after uh, the, the webinar today that we can work with a few of you or all of you directly in, in also um, bringing on board more from California. Next slide. So this is the um, site that we try to keep um, current and updated at all times. However, it says 511 sites today, and I think we are actually at 518. So just a visual there, you can see um, particularly um, all that green, or that, I guess a lime green there in California. And I'm certainly excited to have um, all the representation and all the great work that's already happened, um, particularly in California. Next slide. 
So to be a, a stepping up innovator, uh, this is the, um, the basic, I'll say basic criteria that we have um, asked that a site would be able to demonstrate. And um, this would place a, a, a county, a jurisdiction in hopefully the right place to be able to have um, access to accurate baseline data um, as we do the work of stepping up and um, ask you to set not only a baseline, but moving forward also talking about re uh, reduction targets and how you want to demonstrate progress. So to be able to do that and to be able to be named a, a, a stepping up innovator, the first uh, bullet there is that you have a shared definition of serious mental illness. Um, now, I know from uh, my discussions with Hallie and, and some of the information I've seen that you are at an advantage in California because there, you do have the opportunity to um, adopt um, a um, definition that has been um, um, offered to you as a statewide definition. From there, we ask that every person that is booked into jail is screened using a validated screening tool for mental illness. So this means we mean everyone at the time of booking. So just within those first, you know, few minutes or hour of coming into the jail facility that that screening occurs. And then the next bullet is on for those who are screened as positive results. So there, there's those, um, the results of that are showing that there is potentially symptoms of a serious mental illness, that there would be a process in place um, for a follow-up clinical assessment, so meaning that that assessment is completed by a mental health professional. And we realize, um, certainly as we've done this work um, in various many sites across the country, that jails churn quickly. And this one is maybe not as easy as it sounds just for the fact that many individuals will book out of the jail before that follow-up um, assessment can be completed. So we do work with sites in, and also outlining their process, their they're, um, you know, um, that they're attempting and that they're doing the best they can to locate the individual once they are discharged to complete that assessment process if, if, if again, as if they are discharged quickly and it can't be completed while they're in, in custody. And then the fourth bullet is that the uh, results of the assessment is, is um, electronically recorded um, and whether, and first of all, even recording that the screening was positive we, we see as important, um, again, because many do get out and we don't know if they're, from that point on, they will be able to be tracked, but if we can at least get that initial flag that they screened positive, and then that you have some method to, you know, electronically um, track this data, track this individual. Um, it does not have to be a multi-million dollar um, jail management system. I mean, we have sites across the country that are, you know, checking this information on uh, spreadsheets and so forth, but just that it can be accessed electronically. Next slide. And as of today, these are 18 stepping up innovator counties, and um, so, and we are excited that we have Calaveras and San Luis Obispo uh, already designated there in California and that they will be um, also participating on today's webinar. And I know that um, we would love to have more, more stars there in California. We do have, I think, a little bit of competition across the country. Um, actually, Pennsylvania, I believe, is in the lead with having three stars for their state. Um, so just, I don't know if that's a motivator or not, but um, throw that out there. <laughs> and I think that uh, covers the sites that um, I'm going to discuss, so I will turn it back to, I believe it's going to Hallie next. Great. Thank you, Risa. Um, good morning, everybody. This is Hallie fader I'm a program director in our behavioral health division, calling in from San Diego, and I definitely do feel a little bit like my back's coming up about Pennsylvania having more innovator sites. Um, as, as the, um, it's wonderful to have so many of you on the phone today who have been working on the Stepping Up Initiative in California and also welcome to the people who are joining us for the first time. Um, the slide that we're showing right now is just recognizing that there has been a lot of media attention here. Um, this is just a sampling of local headlines from last year about the issue of overrepresentation of people with mental illnesses in our state's jails. Um, to the extent that we have numbers about this, and that's going to be one of our themes today, 
um, the counties are reporting over 21,000 open mental health cases in the jails. And this is coming to us from the jail profile survey that counties report in to the Board of State and Community Corrections. Um, it's 21,000 where they have reported open mental health cases. I would draw your attention, though, to the asterisk where we did not, I mean, there were 11 counties that did not report, so we know that this is an undercount. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as Risa noted, we have a lot of counties here in California where the Board of Supervisors has already passed a resolution in support of the Stepping Up initiative. We have 37 counties representing just over 90% of the state's population. Um, some of you ha are in counties that passed a resolution almost five years ago. Some of you are in counties that have passed a resolution in the last year or two. But um, the resolution is a commitment by the board to investigate this issue of overrepresentation of people with mental illnesses in the jails and work together to develop strategies to safely reduce that number. Um, there may be an active stepping up group meeting in your county or there may not, but it is helpful to know that there is that commitment from leadership to, um, to be working collaboratively across local systems on this issue. Uh, next slide, please. There has been a lot of support across the state for local leaders working on stepping up, um, working with the California State Sheriff's Association, the Chief Probation Officers of California, and the County Behavioral Health Directors Association of California. We conducted a survey back in 2016, um, and all 58 counties responded, and we did a presentation to what was then the Council on Mentally Ill Offenders now the Council on Criminal Justice and Behavioral Health. And you reported that you, by and large, California counties felt like there were more people with mental illnesses in jails than there had been five years ago. And we heard about a lot of diverse strategies for screening and assessment, data collection, diversion, and re-enrolling people in benefits and re-entry. In 2017, we hosted a Stepping Up California Summit in Sacramento, and 53 counties sent leadership teams to that event, where they heard from their peers as well as state leaders um, expressing their interest in supporting local work on this initiative. Um, as you can see from all the logos on the bottom of the slide, there is a lot of interest from the statewide associations, including um, the California State Association of Counties, as well as from state entities um, in supporting local work on this issue. And Stepping Up has been an important way to coordinate efforts and also elevate the local voice in what you all need in terms of making progress on this issue. Next slide, please. As Risa alluded to, one of the efforts that we've been working on together is the idea of a shared definition of serious mental illness. As anyone who has talked to a psychiatrist before knows, the way that he or she talks about mental illness or serious mental illness is probably different from the way your mother-in-law talks about it, is probably different from the way a jail commander talks about it. But in order to have a consistent way of measuring serious mental illness so that you know whether you're making progress on your stepping up work, you need to be able to have a shared definition that all of the local stakeholders agree with. One example of how different definitions can lead to different data is the slide on, is the graph on the left here. This was a chart that appeared in the Mental Health Almanac from 2018 by the California Healthcare Foundation. And they looked at the three different measures of mental illness that are in that jail profile survey. And you can see how they wind up with understandably different numbers. If you're counting active mental health cases, it's 23% of the average daily population. If it's inmates receiving psych meds, it's 20%. And if it's inmates assigned to mental health beds, it's 6%. So all of those are legitimate ways of counting mental illness, but they all wind up with different numbers. 
Here in California, we worked with the State Sheriff's Association, the Behavioral Health Directors Association, and CPOC as well as advisors from the State of Board of, the Board of Community Corrections and um, what was then FMHAC, the uh, WellPath now, to talk about what were different definitions in existence in California for serious mental illness, and how could that language be made available and accessible to, Calif to California counties working on stepping up? And that led to the development of the model share definition, which is language based on the Welfare and Institutions Code. Um, and if I can get the next slide, we um, put together a resource on the shared definition, that's what's on the left, as well as some frequently asked questions about how counties are using the shared definition. We've also worked um, with our part, our Stepping Up California partners to answer one of the questions we heard loud and clear at the Stepping Up California Summit, which is how do we pay for it? Um, this is the integrated funding tool that you see on the, le on the right that has the purple font. And again, we worked with a diverse advisory group from counties across the state on how they were paying for different diversion and reentry efforts. And that guide is also available online, and we're happy to talk with you about that. So um, we're really excited that counties as different as Calaveras and San Luis Obispo have achieved innovator status here in California, and they've both been very generous with their time in sharing how they're, what they're doing, how they're doing it. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation today about um, what they're doing, see where you have questions, and see how we can identify counties here that are already meeting the criteria to be innovator counties or could easily work towards meeting that criteria. So I will turn it back to Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Hallie. And now I will turn things over to Chief Samuel Leach from Calaveras County. Well, hello, everyone. Hopefully uh, everybody can hear me okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, Calaveras County, just a little bit of context for those of you that uh, are not in the state. Uh, Calaveras County is a small rural county in uh, northern central California. Uh, county population is only about 45,000, and uh, that's uh, what leads us to being proud of our efforts with regard to stepping up is that um, we are a small rural conservative county and uh, we've done some pretty you know, progressive, innovative things in our jail when you consider our population. So uh, you know, many days I don't feel like an innovator because uh, I can still see so many gaps and so many you know, opportunities that still exist to create a better system. Um, but that said, if I rewind five years ago to when we were just looking at passing an initiative, um, we didn't have any of this stuff. I mean, we, we weren't, we didn't have a shared uh, definition of serious mental illness. Uh, we weren't screening the people who came into the jail other than whatever uh, system had existed previously, but it wasn't uh, the validated brief jail mental health screen that we're, we've been using consistently for the past couple of years. And uh, frankly, we didn't have clinical staff in the jail at all, which I'm guessing is, is somewhat similar to a lot of counties if, if you go back enough years, and some of you may still not. Um, we had nursing staff, and then we had uh, you know, some programs that would be offered in there, but we really didn't have higher level uh, clinical support or, or even follow up with assessments. Everybody was just kind of dependent on um, you know, outpatient and getting appointments when they left and there wasn't really any connectivity. So fast forward to today, um, we've been doing the, um, we've had the shared uh, definition of serious mental illness for a couple years now. Uh, we have been, screening everybody that comes into the jail uh, since I believe it was around January 1st of 2018, so a little over two years. Um, we have a full-time licensed clinician in the jail as well as the contract with WellPath uh, for nursing, so those services are coordinated. Uh, but frankly, the, screen, the initial screening with the brief jail mental health screen is done by correctional officers, which um, I think people need to hear because it, it wasn't really 
the most burdensome thing to get that going because we already have, you know, like all of you, uh, a certain process of questions that, that everybody that's getting booked into the jail gets asked anyway. So it really wasn't too tedious to uh, load in the uh, brief jail mental health screen questions in addition to what already existed. Um, and then as far as follow-up, so when we have people screen uh, positive for further assessment, uh, we do have one licensed clinician full-time in the jail, and this is a jail of about 100 beds. Uh, and then we have a clinician at the day reporting center who is also available to help out um, when, when the other one is gone, and then uh, that's also coordinated with, with nursing or uh, psych services. So uh, that's what we have for now. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, and then as far as what we're tracking electronically, um, somebody earlier, Hallie, I don't remember if it was you, but uh, made the comment about, you know, it's okay. There's still plenty of systems who are using Excel spreadsheets and um, you know, keeping this stuff electronically, but maybe not on the most modern technological systems. And, and we are definitely one of those where we, um, we have an analyst who has to do a lot of data pairing um, because, uh, frankly, you know, we have three or four different systems that are tracking it between uh, behavioral health and probation and the jail and the courts. And so there's a lot of things that we're looking at to coordinate uh, data on this. but. What I will say is it's been very helpful to have the brief jail mental health screen uh, to look at trends and also to look at average length of stay. Um, because it was interesting when we first ran the data uh, a year in, a year in to having it, um, we were absolutely shocked to find that we really didn't have a longer length of stay. We were, we were really, really close for length of stay of those who triggered for further assessment and those who didn't, um, which, which I think is unique. Um, but it's nice to have the data to be able to tease it and, and look at, you know, what, what more questions it generates, which is ultimately why I always want to have more data. Um, and then that, you know, brings up the, the last bullet point on the slide that you see now, which is, uh, you know, uh, quantitative analysis without qualitative analysis is always, you know, a little bit tricky. So what's the rest of the story? Um, we like to look at our sequential intercept map, and hopefully everybody knows what that is, but, you know, just kind of picture a, a sequence from start to finish, from the first time a user would be entering the system to the point that a user completely exits the system. Um, it, what are all the points along the way that we have a chance to prevent or intervene uh, in the lives of our uh, criminal justice involved uh, folks with serious mental illness? So what we like to do is at least once a year we come back to our sequential intercept map and we say, where are our gaps? Where are we doing well? And uh, frankly, having the data has really, really helped with that. So um, I think that's the main stuff I have. Great, thank you, Chief Leach. And now I will turn things over to Jessica Yates in San Luis Obispo County. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay, so to make sure. Okay. Um, so yes, like you said, I'm Jess Yates. I'm a business analyst for Stepping Up with the County of San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office. Um, our county became an innovator county in July of 2019, and we signed the Stepping Up initi initiative in October of 2017. As you know, um, becoming an innovator county is a three-step approach um, that at first can sound daunting, but in fact can be accomplished more quickly than throughout. Um, collaboration within our county departments. Um, becoming an innovator county opens up many opportunities to network with cohort innovator counties, leaders in the justice system, uh, mentoring opportunities, and uh, references from other counties as well. Our county was able to participate in a peer exchange for stepping up in Tulsa, Oklahoma this last November, which provided many opportunities to talk to leaders of other counties around the nation regarding not only system changes in order to meet the four key measures of stepping up, but also grant and funding opportunities that are available. Um, innovator counties um, are looked at to be mentors for other counties and have similar goals of reducing the number of individuals with mental illness in the jails and getting them connected to treatments. 
This has opened up many discussions where we are able to learn from each other on what processes and programs have been successful and also which ones are not successful and help um, to make the processes we have more directed and efficient. Um, being an innovator county not only up and opens up opportunities to work with other counties, but also assists in bringing community partners in to help with the cause. We announced that we were an innovator county through press releases, social media, and speaking engagements, and that in and of itself led to community groups being interested in what we were doing as a county and has helped to create stronger partnerships and cohesion between the county and the community stakeholders. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, how we became an innovator county, so um, if we could go to the next slide, um, and what the process looks like, including how each process was implemented and barriers that may arise. Um, our county first started with implementing a validated mental health screen tool um, on every person booked into the jail. Um, being an innovator county, you also need to make the next step of referring the individual to screen positive for symptoms of SMI to a follow-up clinical assessment by a licensed medical health professional. This can sound like a large feat, but you do not need to start out with the entire process being implemented and running automatically right from the start as um, Sam was saying from Calaveras County. Um, that is a long-term goal, but you can break it down into steps. Um, here in our county, we started with implementing the validated screening tool. Um, we use a brief jail mental health screen, and we also have WellPath as our contracted medical provider like Calaveras County. Um, and it was a very manual process at the beginning of implementation. Um, initially, we had paper forms being filled out during the initial jail medical screening at booking. Um, if the individual screened positive, the paper form was then given to a licensed psych tech who would do an assessment and decide if they were high risk and would be scheduled, uh, scheduled for an appointment with a psychologist. Um, our health information technologist at the time would collect all of the screens and manually report back on the data of the number of positive screens and negative screens. And if um, they were then went on to see a, um, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, we have come a long way since then, and we now have the brief gel mental health screen incorporated into our electronic health record, which um, we use as core EMR, and the reports are automated instead of being hand counted. Um, the brief gel mental health screen is still performed during the booking process um, at initial booking, and it is done by the intake nurse. Like he's saying, you could have um, someone else do it, but when the nurse is doing intake, um, they just do this assessment right after they do their initial health assessment. And now, if that screen comes out positive, it creates a task in our system um, for a licensed psych tech to perform a follow-up clinical assessment. This task becomes an alert in the dashboard of our um, electronic health record, and the task stays active until it's performed. These tasks are monitored by um, supervising staff in order to make sure that the follow-up screen is performed. Um, this does not happen overnight, as the forms needed to be approved, and the brief jail mental health screen need to be accepted in, as the validated tool we wanted to use. And our um, chief medical officer in the jail needed to work with our contracted medical provider uh, to implement that process. But it all just started with paper copies um, being right there at intake. Um, the process now works very well and is a great help in identifying the individual's mental illness um, in a short time from being booked, as well as getting them the services more quickly. Uh, the next step that we took in order to meet the criteria of becoming an innovator county is that we established a shared definition of SMI for our stepping up efforts that is used throughout our criminal justice and behavioral health system. This step, the step in this process is one um, that really only requires collaboration between your local departments and also your contracted jail medical provider if you have one. We started out by working with our behavioral health department in order, in order to get their definition that they use for their programs. We then took that definition and worked with uh, WellPath and to get them on the same page and um, agree on that definition that they were using as well. And the final step is that we took the definition and presented it to our steering committee for final countywide adoption. Since we began um, with not trying to reinvent the wheel and use the same definition that our largest provider of mental health in our community was using, which is our behavioral health department, um, it was then just a matter of collaborating and adopting that definition countywide for our stepping up efforts. The last step that we implemented in order to meet the criteria of being an innovator county was to record the clinical assessment results as well as regularly report on that population. Um, this is probably the most challenging part of becoming an innovator county um, as far as our perspective goes, um, as a significant amount of um, barriers come up between sharing information and discussion of what is and is not allowed by HIPAA. That comes up a lot. Um, throughout this process, we have learned that while there are strict guidelines on reporting individuals with mental illness, uh, there are not strict guidelines on reporting on that population as a whole. 
Our county began by designing a process that de-identifies individuals and reports numbers and statistics on that population. Um, in order to do this and be compliant, uh, we wrote and implemented a memorandum of understanding between all agencies involved. We initially sent a request to the California Department of Justice in order to get approval for the sharing of this information, um, but they directed us to work within our county to share the information and uh, just record how it is done. Within our memorandum of understanding, we defined the purpose, the participating agencies, um, each department's specific roles and responsibilities, the non-disclosure of information and requirements of that, as well as individuals that were cleared for the project. Once we had the memorandum of understanding in place, we were able to begin collecting and reporting on um, that population. Um, by being able to implement the brief general health screen, having a shared definition of, uh, definition of mental illness, and reporting internally on this population, we've been able to be named in Innovator County, which um, we we're very uh, proud of that title. Um, I've also been asked to talk to you about uh, working with a contracted medical provider in the jail and how that impacts this process. And through our chief medical officer, our jail programs unit, and the support of our sheriff, we've built a strong relationship with our medical provider. Um, this is a process um, as they are contracted and do not have to abide by you know, our requests unless it's in their contract. So through relationship building and compromise, we've been able to come, um, become really a partnership and align our goals with them. Um, the medical provider does perform our initial screening. They record it electronically in the medical record. They do perform the follow-up assessments, and, um, which helps us identify that population. Um, our jail staff does assist in working um, to make sure that the medical provider has access to the individuals um, when they're needing screening in a timely manner. But like the shared definition, it is through collaboration and relationship building that really has um, helped us become successful in reporting on this population. Another uh, big topic is funding for these projects. Um, it takes um, programs in order to implement uh, not only the three steps of becoming an innovator county, but to meet the four key, key measures of stepping up. Here in San Luis Obispo County, um, we've been awarded the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Grant, um, which is a Category 1. This grant funds my position as well as um, another part-time associate working on the Stepping Up Initiative. Um, as with all the counties in California, um, we also have our Mental Health Services Act funds that fund many programs that help us toward our Stepping Up goals. Uh, the MHSA programs in our county include mental health diversion cords, adult full service partnerships, a crisis stabilization unit, behavioral health clinicians that um, is embedded with our local San Luis Obispo City Law Enforcement Agency, um, and uh, many other programs within the MHSA that assist in our endeavor. Um, we also have received the SAMHSA Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Early Diversion Grant, which funds our behavioral health um, community action teams um, within the county jurisdiction and our sheriff's office. These are just a few of the grants and funding sources that we use here in our county that supports the efforts of stepping up. Um, and I encourage each of you to work towards becoming an innovator county as throughout this process, having other counties to call, to network with, to discuss efficient and inefficient processes with, as well as having others um, mentor us, as well as our county becoming a mentor to other counties is really invaluable. Um, becoming an innovator county has opened up opportunities, like I was saying earlier, to partner and collaborate not only with other counties, but with local organizations and stakeholders. And becoming an innovator county is something that your county can be proud of. Um, we are continuing to discover and find many advantages and positive impacts of becoming an innovator county. And if you have any questions, or um, feel free to reach out to me, and um, I'd be happy to talk to you or link you with other resources that um, help in the stepping up process. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Jesse. So now we have some time for questions and answers, and I'll remind uh, people who are logged in to uh, chat questions into the chat box if they think of any. Um, one question we have about the Innovator County criteria is, for the clinical assessments, do those have to be conducted at the jail? Um, Risa, do you want me to, or should I have you answer that one? Sure, I will, um, I will answer it, but certainly um, would love for um, Sam and, and Jesse to chime in um, as far as their process. Um, but I think I said earlier, we realize that the churn in jail can be very quickly. We know some can, you know, maybe even bind out in a matter of a few hours. So it's unrealistic to think that all these um, assessments would also be completed. And so various um, ways that we've seen this done as far as, you know, being, um, you know, 
meeting, I guess, the expectations for an innovator county is just to be able to line out the process that you would have in place to um, be able to track the individual upon discharge. Um, so more than just handing them, you know, a business card, but, you know, if there is somebody that would be their uh, main point of contact in your local uh, mental health um, provider, um, sometimes if you see it works super well if they, the, that organization is, has access and has, you know, in reach into the jail to where they can actually come into the jail, again, as time allows, to be aware of who is being discharged from the jail that is maybe either a prior client that just needs to be reconnected or if it would be a new outreach um, situation for them. But that tends to be the main way to, that we see for um, making those connections um, if the individual is discharged. So I, I hope that's helpful and if not, you know, again, I think if Sam and Jesse want to chime in as well, that might be helpful. Well, we use, um, you know, we get as many done as we can in the jail, knowing that, you know, we only have one clinician and things can only move so fast. Um, plus, just with the reality of people being booked in and out in a small rural county, uh, a lot of folks that are being booked in and out are, are people that we know. Um, so it, it's very different than if we were, you know, down in Los Angeles or something. I mean, m most of the folks have, have met the clinician before. Um, they've met the clinicians at, at outpatient behavioral health. And one of the advantages is having um, actual county behavioral health clini clinical staff working there because we have the same clinicians working at the jail, the uh, day reporting center, which is uh, currently attached to county behavioral health outpatient. So they're able to connect with each other. But I think the, the key thing that we've added within the last uh, uh, year, year and a half or so has been having behavioral health um, triage case managers uh, additional to that. So we have seven days a week we have um, case manager supports working for behavioral health, um, but specifically with this population. So they're in and out of the jail. They also do, um, you know, CIT response with uh, the sheriff's patrol units. So they're kind of the go-betweens for everything, and they make sure that the follow-up assessments, um, that, that nobody gets dropped and that there's warm handoffs and, and all of that. So I encourage having some kind of position like that, too. But that's, that's something that we've added down the line, and, and we were functioning pretty well without it. I just think it's a really good uh, augment to our system. Um, but then, if, if I'm heard the question correctly, um, we do. Um, was this one when someone is diagnosed with SMI? Does that diagnosis follow them through future bookings? Um, is that the question that was asked? Let's make sure. So, Jesse, um, I think it's the question is around at your, you know the screening was positive and then they they bond out or they're discharged and you didn't get the assessment done. What is how what is your process for that? Okay. Um, here in our county, fortunately, we um, we have over um, lately over a 95% um, completion of our assessment because it is required at booking. And so, but what does happen is they might have a positive screening and booking, and then it's, you know within 72 hours someone comes um, and sees them, but sometimes they're not there for 72 hours. And so it is noted um, in their chart. So um, if they do come back, which we do see a high rate of recidivism within that population, um, you know, that is noted. And so those frequent flyers are easier to catch. Um, but if they're already released and we have not been able to um, do anything with that um, particular individual, um, unfortunately, there is nothing that happens once they're released into the community. Um, we are trying to, um, or we are implementing at release, um, especially for the people that it was less than 72 hours or maybe someone hadn't come and done that follow-up assessment yet, um, we do give them, it's just like a little contact card and say, hey, if you need any help, call these numbers, which we're just starting to do that, just so we're trying to give them something. Um, but that um, kind of that book and release population is one that um, we're right now working on a process um, in order to um, give them more services even though there's a quick turn time because it's really hard to um, get to them when, again, they're only here for 24 hours at times and they had a positive assessment. Thanks, um, Jesse. And um, 
I mean, if, if you're saying you're getting 95% um, of those who screen positive assessed, I mean, that, that's, that's amazing. Um, Sam, I'm curious about um, if they are ordered onto probation supervision, if that's something you maybe follow up with at that, at that point. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm not sure what else you, you want me to follow up with on that. But well, no, yeah. I mean, just mean that information, does that information get transferred to probation so that you know while the individual was in jail, they screen positive and there is a need for a follow-up assessment that maybe then the probation officer can kind of help facilitate? So in many places, we, you know, we see that yeah. that information does not follow the individual, um, so probation doesn't know. I'm just curious about your situation. Yeah, not you know, uh, not normally. We don't have it set up to be notified if they if they screen positive on the on the brief screen. But um, if a further assessment uh, determines that, then then yes, absolutely. Because we have uh, a mental health court. We have a an additional mental health uh, caseload where they're not in mental health uh, court, but but we do feel like they need um, further support and maybe. Uh, a more supportive hand from probation. So um, we are notified on those, and, and we, you know, it, it's a different world because we are such a small jurisdiction that uh, the clinicians um, are meeting on a regular basis with probation staff. So it, it's almost like a wraparound approach um, when it comes to that, where even though we don't ha have it as automated as you would have to do in a larger jurisdiction, um, it, it's routine and consistent. Thanks to both of you. Mark, are there other questions? Maybe we should move on. Yeah, yeah, I want to turn to the one uh, that came in that said, when someone is diagnosed as SMI, does that diagnosis follow them to future bookings to measure SMI prevalence, or does that data reset for each new booking? Um, here in San Luis Obispo County, um, it is kept in their record, so when if they come and they're booked again, and when they pull up the record, they will see that they were flagged for SMI. So for us, it does follow them each time they come back into the jail. Yeah, and same in Calaveras. I mean, unless there's been a change since they've been in, in outpatient, stabilized, you know, some kind of change in diagnosis or something like that. But yes, it, it does follow them. Great, thank you. And then another question we have is um, how do Calaveras and SLO share behavioral health data between county behavioral health and WellPath, or do they? And is county behavioral health data used to measure SMI prevalence or just WellPath data? Um, here in Slow County, um, WellPath um, data and county behavioral health data do not share with each other. So we have a system where we're able to identify the individuals, um, you know, through that the booking process and the brief jail mental health screen. And once those are, uh, individuals are identified, then we have set up a program, literally, that puts those um, individuals in along with um, some other quote unquote um, not real individuals, so that it's the identified, and then they're matched in this system, and then it comes out with um, with data that is not linked to an individual, but just as a um, as a group and overall, so that's how we're able to share that data. And the second of the question, so WellPath, um, I'm trying to remember the second half of the question. Okay, and then. Uh, yeah, so is, is um, county behavioral health data used to measure SMI prevalence or just the WellPath data? So, um, we, well, within the jail, um, so county behavioral health, since um, we are just specifically looking at, at individuals who are booked into the jail, um, we feel that we have gotten to a point where we're able to identify those individuals at the jail, and then after that, it's shared with behavioral health. But behavioral health doesn't give us a list of their clients, and then, you know, we don't put it in and go, well, if any of these clients who are serving or are receiving mental health, that behavioral health happen to get booked they're not like on, you know, we don't have a big chart that's just listed for people who have never um, been booked into the jail. So it is uh, just people who are booked, whether that was um, well-passed data or um, information that we already had or probation. 
um, for probation, we actually um, do have a list. We have a special probation officer that specifically works with this community, and that information is shared as well, which has made it a lot more um, cohesive in their in their care. Yeah, and in Calaveras, uh, sorry to uh, weasel out of the answer on this question. Um, I do know that WellPath and Behavioral Health are coordinating uh, their data sharing, uh, but that's only because I attended the initial meeting where they started that. Uh, outside of that, uh, because I'm, you know, the chief probation officer, I, it's not my jail, uh, it's not my behavioral health clinician, so I'm less familiar with some of the, the details on that. I just know that it's being shared, um, but I don't remember exactly what, what they put in place to be able to do that. Great, thank you. And another question we have is, um, how are the counties planning to sustain the work after the grant funding is used up? So that's a great question, um, and it's, I'm assuming it's coming from outside of California. Uh, we're, we're lucky, we're, we're not actually using grant funding in Calaveras, we're using um, AB 109 funding, so that's you know a permanent funding source, and, and we're lucky that we had not overspent that um, because it, it just made natural sense. Now, some of it is being supplemented with SB 678 funding, which which is not uh, permanent stable funding, but that's that's probation dollars that go toward treatment. Um, so, no, we're, we're in a good place for that. Uh, we banked up money for years and planned for it. We're, we're in the black, so we're, we're lucky. Probably not what you wanted to hear. Um, we here in San Luis Obispo County, and a lot of um, upfront work that was done with grants um, was work that's only going to be done one, done one time in order to get a lot of the processes um, in place, identify our gaps, um, and you know work toward that. Um, in saying that, though, we are always continuing to look for new grants to come up and grant opportunities in order to assist with um, the new programs that we're implementing and where we want to go. As things are always getting better and changing, um, more grants have been available. So um, we collaborate countywide with like a weekly email about grant opportunities coming up and discuss um, where it could help and how we can um, implement it for future programs. Um, like I was saying earlier, our MHSA funds um, are fund a lot of our programs that help with the endeavor of stepping up, and those are you know going to be around as far as we know until um, million dollar earners uh, disappear out of California, which I don't think is going to happen. So we're confident in um, in that funding stream as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have is: Have the counties liked the brief jail mental health screen? or other validated screens? I guess maybe question, have considered other liked? validated screens. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Jesse, you're, you're speaking for the jail, so you'd probably have a better perspective, but um, I have not heard any complaints on it. It really wasn't, uh, it really wasn't too heavy of a lift, to be quite frank. Yeah, what we've liked about the brief general health screen is that is it's a brief screen. It's something that um, was a validated tool, so that's one of the reasons why we it was chosen in the first place. And um, being implemented just helps um, helps us to identify people quicker. Um, obviously, there are you know a lot of people who will screen positive who end up ha with a follow up assessment who are not found to have um, a mental illness or a severe mental illness. Um, but it definitely has helped us to um, track our efforts and um, at least go and see them and put eyes on them and see if we need to further assess. But um, we do like the brief jail mental health screen, and uh, another big reason is because it is, uh, the time of it does not take too long, and it's just a few questions, and, um, and then it's done. And then we have an automated task thing, so it, it works very well for us. Yeah, I think it just fits right in with a, with a normal jail intake process. Um, I, I've been really happy with it for that, and I, and I think it just, it's a real easy way to just get a starter kit kind of tracking mechanism to start asking more questions about how we deal with, you know, people with mental illness who are being booked into our jail and, and what we do with them when they're exiting and how we further assess them. And I mean, there's so many questions that, that come from such a simple tool. So, 
So I like that. I thought it was the, one of the easiest parts of the system that we uh, implemented, and I'm happy we did. Great. Thanks so much. And then there was one last question about um, the brief gel mental health screen being tracked and followed in the electronic health record, and they were wondering if the SMI diagnosis is treated in the same way. Um, so with our system, our brief gel mental health screen, it's either um, positive or negative, and how we track that is just by a count. Um, the SMI population, what that is, that since that is um, it's a medical diagnosis that is treated um, like, you know, as a part of their medical record. And so they are not tracked the same in the sense of um, one is a positive or a negative and one, um, one is going to be um, some type of diagnosis. And so in that sense, they're not, they're not tracked exactly the same way. Yeah, same in Calibris. Okay, great. Uh, well, that was it for the questions, I believe. Um, and the, the panelists are more than happy to follow up uh, by email. Um, and then I uh, wanted to thank all of the panelists for joining the webinar today and for presenting and everyone for attending. Um, we'll send a recording of this webinar to participants. Uh, and also, Hadley will be sending a link to um, the survey that we talked about earlier that will um, have a brief a brief few questions about whether your counties will um, be able to meet the criteria to be an innovator, and then we can follow up individually. Um, but we look forward to receiving the survey results and to following up. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining the webinar today.